On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, another deluxe supercharger is under construction out west, this time between LA and Vegas. Plus, Tesla's in-car navigation continues to get better and better, Panasonic gears up for mass production of Tesla's 4680 battery cells, and more. What's happening, friends? Ryan McCaffrey here with you alongside Daisy the Boxer. It's episode 357 of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, coming to you weekly every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. This episode's for June 5th, 2022. And let me just start real quick with Daisy because I got some excellent news. I had the first of two uh, professional consultations before just jumping right into a surgery. I thought, let me just get a couple more opinions. The first one was from a veterinary physical therapist who I had actually taken Maggie to. I really came to know and trust her. She deals with rehabbing injuries all the time. And in in Maggie's case, she suffered from a degenerative illness and she helped really maintain Maggie's quality of life for longer. And so I I took Daisy there. You know, she sees these kinds of injuries, ACLs and, and all kinds of knee injuries and things. And very quickly, she established, uh, she looked at the x-rays and then gave her a thorough physical examination and said, no, this this dog does not need surgery. She thinks it may be a a partial cruciate tear or even possibly a muscle strain near the hip, the psoas muscles. But based on how Daisy has responded and the fact that she hasn't been limping around for a while, she was pretty emphatic. This dog does not need surgery. So that was huge Huge good news for me this week, which I'm so, so grateful for. The other consultation is in a couple weeks with an orthopedic surgeon, and I think I'm still going to keep it and just why not get one more opinion, but I'm, I am I would have to be uh, very, I don't know what he would have to say to convince me to do surgery at this point after this person that is a big time professional that I know and trust gave me this uh, pretty strong, you know, no surgery verdict here. So just so grateful for that. That is uh, huge news. Now, one more thing before I get started, if you'll permit me just a couple more minutes here to talk about myself. I normally don't talk about myself. Uh, I try to keep it all about Tesla because that's what you're here for. But this podcast now has been going for almost seven years. The seven-year anniversary is coming up in just a couple months. What we are at right now is the six-year anniversary of my Patreon. Six years ago, I launched my Patreon over the years through which many of you have kindly chosen to support my efforts with this podcast. That is really the, that is the primary way it's monetized. Now, the show is always free. It's, you know, and always will be. So you can, as I say at the end of the show, you can voluntarily choose to support it. So six years in celebration of this, I thought it was time to make a couple of changes to the Patreon, not to the podcast, just to the Patreon that I hope you'll find fun. Maybe it'll inspire you to join the Patreon if you haven't already. Maybe it'll inspire you to up your pledge. Maybe, maybe not. But if you just give me a couple of quick minutes here, I will uh, just tell you about it. So the big change is in the ludicrous tier, which is the $10 a month tier. That tier had been, in addition to the early access that the sport tier, the uh, $5 tier gets, That Ludicrous Tier was also getting the once per month bonus episode, which was the recording of the previous month's Patreon Zoom hangout, the next of which is coming up. Actually, it'll have already already happened. It's this weekend. It's uh, uh, Sunday. So it's the day this show airs is the next one. So I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, what I've decided to do is to change this to do something new. I am going to, starting this week, I'm going to start doing a weekly bonus mini episode that I think I'm going to call the lightning round because, you know, it just seems like a fitting name for a show called Ride the Lightning. And the idea here is that it's going to be 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, however long I talk about some topic that is tangential to Tesla that I think you will find interesting that people that are interested in Tesla will enjoy call it just Tesla adjacent topics. And my plan is to kick it off with my thoughts on the new 
DeLorean Alpha 5 electric vehicle and the both very good and very bad things that I think DeLorean Motor Company is doing with that car that they are aiming to, to bring to production in a couple of years. Obviously, I mean, I've mentioned the DeLorean EV here before, but it's not something that I think belongs on the Tesla podcast, right? It's not a Tesla thing. So I think that this is a topic that would be good. These kinds of things that if you're listening to this, that you might be interested in uh, hearing me talk about more if you're if you jump onto the Patreon with me. Other topics might be what I think of Lucid or Rivian or the F-150 Lightning, etc. And I'm also inviting Patreon backers to submit topics, submit questions for that as well, either via email or just post on Patreon or call in with it, whatever you want to do. That way, I figure you're hearing from me more often about other fun EV-related topics that wouldn't normally end up on Ride the Lightning. So I'm hoping that you guys will enjoy that. And I'm just going to you know, try to put a little bit more uh, into so you get a little more out of the Patreon if you're kind enough to back me. Also, the plaid tier, which was the $20 a month tier, is being eliminated. Now, nobody who's in that tier now needs to do anything, to be clear. Your pledge will continue should you choose to continue with it, and you'll continue to get uh, all of the same perks that you've been getting. Except I want to add one. I want to thank all of those wonderful folks who've been backing at that tier, which for many of you is a long time. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, you're again, you're welcome to continue backing at that tier. I don't want to put any pressure on you to, to have to raise your pledge, anything like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grandfather everybody that's in the plaid tier now into the monthly Zoom hangouts that are part of the maximum plaid tier. So you folks are going to get grandfathered in as long as you maintain your pledge. If you want to upgrade to the Maximum Plaid officially, great. I would be very grateful for that. But as long as you maintain the pledge you've got, I just want to grandfather you in as a way to express my gratitude for your continued generosity there. And finally, about the Maximum Plaid tier, that will stay the same. We'll still do the monthly Zoom Hangouts. As again, there's one happening today as, as of when the show is releasing. And I'm still going to record those, but I'm just going to keep those available. The recordings of those will be available exclusively to the folks at the maximum plaid tier or higher uh, as a way that those folks can either go back and listen to them again if they were in, if they were there and participated and want to want to go back and hear it again or listen to them if they weren't able to join for that particular month. Uh, and by the way, anyone, uh, this is a continued policy as well, nothing new here. Anybody that makes any new pledge of any amount or upgrades their pledge any amount will still get a one-time, just a you know, welcome slash thank you invite to whatever the next Zoom, monthly Zoom hangout is. So again, the podcast itself turns seven in two months And it's also been six awesome years on Patreon. And I I seriously, before I get going with the show here, I just want to sincerely thank all of you who have shown me the kindness of supporting me on the Patreon, which again, my Patreon page is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. There's also a link in the show description every week if that's uh, easier for you. But I really just want to say thank you to those Patreon backers because That's what, honestly, that's a big part of what fuels me to keep putting in the work here week in and week out, never missing a week and always trying to put together the best, most factually accurate, well-researched, informative, and hopefully entertaining podcast that I can. So thank you all. And with that, let's get to this week's Tesla news. There's plenty of it. Uh, More big news and good news to start the week in the supercharger department from Marco RP, who told us about the drive-in and diner supercharger in Hollywood for last week's podcast. Now, I have said that I've been wanting another Kettleman City to see more, not just one, more of them, plural, but I want to see more Kettleman Cities, big supercharging stations, with lounges, just these nice places that are actual destinations to go to with nice clean bathrooms, places for Tesla owners to go 
and, and relax and literally recharge, figuratively recharge. And now it looks like more of those are starting to happen. If you drive your Tesla between Los Angeles, California and Las Vegas, Nevada, you are probably gonna wanna stop in at this one when it opens up. Marco took to Twitter to say this, quote, a brand new charging hub is coming soon to the I-15 corridor. California-based company Stack Charge is set to open its first station next year in Baker, California at 56383 Mojave Point Road. The location will house 32 superchargers, eight DC fast chargers, and a restaurant and retail area for travelers. Thank you, Marco. So as you can tell from the description there, it's not Tesla owned and operated the way that Kettleman City is. It's run by this company, Stack Charge. There's a concept s sketch of it as well on Marco's Twitter that he posted with this message, which by the way, if you do wanna follow him on Twitter to keep track of all things Supercharger, cause Marco is on it more than anyone else that I see in the community. And that is a compliment of the highest order. Marco is the Supercharger news guru. He's at Marco RP Tesla on Twitter. But anyway, that sketch, that concept art, shows a drive-through for whatever the fast food, presumably fast food, tenant is gonna be there. I would vote for In-N-Out Burger myself, although In-N-Out does seem to mostly do their own thing rather than partner up with anybody else. But anyway, uh, also in the sketch you can see it's got solar panel canopies over all of the charging stations, all the supercharger stalls, just like Kettleman City, which is a great thing in general, certainly, but especially in the middle of the desert between LA and Vegas when you need the shade and you get the bonus of the sun giving you as much solar power all day long, most of the year, as you can possibly harness. Three of the chargers in the concept sketch as well are pull-through stalls also, which is gonna be music to your ears for those of you who may be out towing jet skis or towing whatever behind your cyber trucks in the next couple of years. Some more good context about this deluxe station provided by Drive Tesla Canada, who writes, there will be a 2,500 square foot restaurant space, which will include a pickup counter, as well as a drive through window that will be open 24 hours a day. That is good news too. There will be seating inside, uh, on the inside, pardon me, and a covered patio outside the building. If the on-site restaurant is not to your taste, the Stack Charge Hub is located within walking distance of several other food options, including Burger King, Arby's, Carl's Jr., and more. The town of Baker is currently home to a 40-stall supercharger at the Dairy Queen. In November of 2021, six months ago, Tesla filed plans to expand that station by another 56 stalls. Once the new Stack Charge location opens, again next year, there will be a total of 128 supercharger stalls within a half mile radius. Wow, that is some serious supercharging capability along that Interstate 15 corridor between LA and Vegas. I love seeing this, and I hope that this starts to become more commonplace across the United States, and quite frankly, around the world as well. And I know that that's not gonna happen overnight, but if, it re it's, if it's reflective at all of the growth of the supercharger network itself, call it, let's just call it version one of the supercharger network. And I'm not talking about the speed of the superchargers, I'm talking about the, the infrastructure of the chargers themselves, like the quantity of them, and the amenities around them, again, like with Kettleman City kind of representing the biggest and best, and now this stack charge station also being in that category. But the, the supercharging network really did kind of start on the coasts. You know, the first ones were between LA and San Francisco on the West Coast, and then on the East Coast, it was that sort of Northeastern seaboard, Boston to New York was kind of the first big hub. So, uh, and then it just sort of sprouted, you know, just grew uh, up and down the coast and then spread inward as well. And now we have a supercharger network where you can mostly drive anywhere in the United States and you've got supercharger access 
along those major interstate routes, which is just amazing. So hopefully these deluxe level superchargers will also mirror that where we're just going to see more and more of them. Now, I'm not necessarily rooting for them to start on the coasts. I think it might it might end up making the most sense for it to work out that way because uh, the plurality of Teslas themselves are on the coast. It's again, no dig at the at the at the Midwest, at Texas, you know, there's there's certainly plenty of Teslas between the coasts, but you've got this higher concentration of them on the East Coast, on the West Coast. So we'll see if more and more of these high end, just you know, uh, dine in superchargers, these these ones with lounges and shops, start to come in on the coast and then continue. We just start to see more and more of them everywhere. Would love to see it, but good news on this one between LA and Vegas. How about some more good news? Tesla's in-car navigation continues to get better and better. An official Tesla tweet from their account said, Tesla navigation will now take predicted crosswind, headwind, humidity, and temperature into account for calculating battery percentage on arrival. This is in addition to the current factors, which are predicted speed, HVAC use, elevation changes, current temperature, and route slash distance. You know, it's, I, I don't, I say this like laughingly, I don't say this maliciously at all, but it's, it, it's almost like Tesla is slowly trying to put a better route planner out of business. Kind of like when Apple finally got, they realized, wait a second, there's all these flashlight apps that people were making for the iPhone before Apple finally got wise and decided to just build that functionality straight into iOS themselves. But in all seriousness, though, uh, I do want to make very clear, a better route planner is great. I have used it. It lets you really drill in to a lot of details for the power user road trippers out there. So check it out sometime, a better route planner. They have the website, but they also have an app. But in my experience, I will say, uh, currently without these new updates about headwind, humidity, crosswind, temperature, then in my experience, the Tesla's in-car range estimates and charging estimates have been pretty accurate, even in my performance model three with the 20-inch wheels that suck a lot more <laughs> they're juice, you know, they're a lot more inefficient than say the 18 inch aero wheels. But I will say the one time that I remember it being kind of unreliable on me on a trip was with headwinds involved. I was on the, the last leg of a drive from San Francisco to Phoenix at one point a few years ago. And I ended up needing to charge way more than uh, just way more charging miles than real world miles. And I came to figure out later, like why the heck did that happen? It was headwinds heading uh, into Phoenix, heading in that direction. Although elevation, certainly the elevation change, you are going up from, you know, when you're at the, the border of California and Arizona and you head for Phoenix on Interstate 10 East, you are making a gradual but fairly significant rise into elevation. Now, I know the system, as we heard, already accounts for elevation, I mean, you can see that. If you look at the energy graph in your car when you're going over a mountain, it knows. You can see the prediction on your chart that you're going to use a ton of juice going up that mountain, and then you're going to regen a bunch of juice coming down the other side. You know, I remember when the supercharging estimates first went into the cars, when the nav, the in-car nav first started telling you which superchargers you would need to stop at and how long you'd need to stay at each one of them for, it was actually back, it's before I became an owner, it was back in the Model S days, the, the pre-Model 3 Model S days, in other words, pre-2017. I remember it so well, even though I wasn't an owner then, because what I remember is Elon, in his ever-present optimism, he hyped it up. He phrased it, I would say, it's fair to say, a little dramatically when he teased it, he said that Tesla was about to end range anxiety. And that was how he teased it. And everybody thought, wait a second, what is he talking about? Is Tesla about to release a super long range Model S, like a 400 mile range car? I mean, they did eventually do that later. But as it turned out, 
Tesla, excuse me, Elon was talking about this software feature. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a great feature to have. I don't want to undersell this, but the way I look at it is this, because just to, again, to, to reassure, to, to reinforce how, how valuable this feature definitely is, uh, even if Elon may have been guilty of overhyping it a little bit, how annoying would road tripping be if you didn't have those estimates in your car's navigation system? It would be quite a bit more annoying to travel. You'd have to map things out ahead of time. You'd, you'd definitely have to do a lot more uh, work yourself to make sure that you're going to get where you need to go without running out of charge. But uh, still, Elon, in his eternal optimism, <laughs> he, he phrased it pretty strongly, but it's still definitely a super valuable feature. But having this feature get better now, meaning more accurate, really, in our cars, that is that is only a good thing. It's going to help people further avoid stressful or anxious situations more often in terms of, you know, if you happen to be getting low on juice before you get to your next supercharger. And I'll say, I really genuinely appreciate Tesla continuing to put work on this, work into this, I should say. And because what it does is it makes the overall driving experience, the overall traveling experience, and really the overall ownership experience better for those of us who are fortunate enough to own these cars. So thank you. Anybody from the Tesla software team that may be listening to this podcast, thank you. Your efforts do not go unrecognized. Next up this week, Tesla's Shanghai plant, Giga Shanghai, has restored weekly output to 70% of pre-lockdown levels from China, according to sources via Reuters reporting here. They say Tesla has restored weekly output at its Shanghai plant to nearly 70% of the level which it had operated at before the city's COVID-19 lockdown, according to two people familiar with the matter. The U.S. automaker, which added a second shift of workers in the middle of last week, is expected to increase output further this week, said the people who declined to be named as the matter is private. Bringing production back to pre-lockdown levels has been a challenge for Tesla at the Shanghai plant, known as Gigafactory 3, amid the ongoing lockdown of the Chinese economic hub, which forced the factory to shut for 22 days. While the city government had given Tesla significant help to reopen, the company had battled numerous obstacles such as insufficient workers, as well as logistics problems that impacted the supplies of parts, including wire harnesses. Shanghai authorities will cancel many conditions for businesses to resume work from earlier this week, a city official said on sun this past Sunday, a week ago, as it looks to start lifting citywide lockdown that began some two months ago and will also introduce policies to support its battered economy. Thank you to Reuters there. Now, first of all, yeah, solid reporting by Reuters, but real quick, as a fellow journalist, I do have to call out that Gigafactory 3 reference. That is a deep cut right there. Tesla and Elon have not referred to it as Gigafactory 3 for a number of years now. Tesla's been pretty clear about naming them after their locations, over these past couple of years, Giga Nevada, Giga Shanghai, Giga Texas, Giga Berlin. But back on topic here, I do think as we look ahead to the end of this quarter, which is coming up at the end of this month, I think it's pretty safe to presume at this point that Tesla's Q2 output is probably not going to be as good as Q1 was. And the reason you heard it there, that Tesla lost a lot of time in Shanghai, which I might remind you has been their most productive, literally their most productive. They produce the most things of their factories. I mean, yes, don't, I'm not trying to disrespect Fremont. Fremont, from the reports we had, is humming along at over their capacity. So they're doing great, as I talked about a few episodes back. And Texas, and really more so Berlin, they are producing Model Ys, but Texas seems to be still at a trickle of Model Ys, and Berlin is in the earlier stages of its production ramp, but making progress. In fact, good news on that front, 
As Drive Tesla Canada reported this past week that Tesla has added a second shift to the Giga Berlin plant. Quote, according to a source familiar with the plans, the second shift at Giga Berlin starts today, which was at the time Monday, May 23rd. This gives Tesla 16 hours of production at the factory with the first shift running from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. and the second shift taking over at 3 p.m. and working until 11 p.m. Along with increased production, Giga Berlin has also significantly increased the volume of white Model Ys it has been producing in recent weeks. As we previously reported, the Giga Berlin paint shop started using white in its production runs on April 2nd, adding to the black paint it had been using since officially opening on March 22nd. Thank you to Drive Tesla Canada there. Still, though, if, if we take a 10,000 foot view on this, pull back as I like to do, it seems like Tesla just may have lost too much time this quarter. You heard it, 22 days in Shanghai. They might have lost too much time in this quarter in order to make it all up in time for the end of the quarter coming up again in less than one month, about three weeks away or so. I think it's reasonable to suspect that Tesla will not match its production or delivery numbers from Q1, which just to remind you, I went and double checked, 305,407 cars produced in Q1, 310,048 cars delivered. So if that does end up being the case, if Q2 ends up down quarter over quarter, it would put an unfortunate end to quite a long hot streak of quarter over quarter production growth for Tesla. And should that come to pass, it'll, I think it's fair to forecast, like if you really take a look at the bigger picture, I think it's probably going to be the only time that that happens for the long foreseeable future, because the more time goes on, the more the new factories are going to be fully ramped up. And then next year, you'll have the Cybertruck contributing meaningfully to production and delivery totals at building over the course of 2023 as well. So we'll see what happens, but however it shakes out, we should have the numbers, the production and delivery numbers, not the profitability numbers, those will be later, but the production delivery numbers four weeks from right now, four episodes from now, that's no doubt going to be a big topic for that podcast. It'll be what? Episode 361. Next this week, Panasonic saying that it has shipped samples of Tesla's 4680 battery cell to the automaker ahead of its own mass production on those cells. Thank you to Tesla Roddy for reporting this one. They write, Panasonic detailed its plans for the production timeline during the first day of the company's annual investor in, uh, event. Quote, a pilot line created first in Japan made it possible to start large-scale prototype production in May, said Kazuo Tadanobu, Panasonic's energy business CEO, during the event. Panasonic believes mass production of the 4680 cell is set to begin in March of 2023 when the company's fiscal year starts. Panasonic's Wakayama plant will initially handle the production of the cell. It will then be shifted to North America. Tadanobu has not committed in the past to produce the 4680 cells in the United States, but now that he is stating the company will transition production in North America, it could bring another plant to the U.S. Reuters, who initially reported on Panasonic shipping 4680 samples to Tesla, said the company is looking at sites in Kansas and Oklahoma, said people familiar with the matter. Panasonic only has Tesla as a client for the new cells, and I suspect that will remain the case for the at least near-term foreseeable future. I have to admit here, though, when I first started reading this story to myself, I got really stoked because I was thinking, yes, reinforcements are on the way, four million cars per year, here we come, and then I kept reading and I was like, well, wait a second. We got mass production not until March of next year, nine months from now, when they've got prototypes off for final approval to Tesla in May. 
that's 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 a that's a bit of a turnaround. That's a bit of a long wait, but also a bit of the wind out of my sails on my enthusiasm there. But still, it's great to have a timeline for it. Number one, and the good news there is that again, let's look at the bigger picture. That timeline aligns with Tesla's big goals for next year. If Panasonic is going to be mass producing 4680 cells starting in March and Tesla is already mass producing them at that point in time at Cato Road, Giga Texas, and maybe even Giga Berlin by then and presumably also Giga Nevada, then guess what? that's going to help Tesla achieve its goals, th- big goals for next year of launching the following vehicles in 2023. The Cybertruck, which we know needs the 4680 battery cells. The Tesla Semi, which also needs the 4680s. And the Tesla Roadster, which I also presume will utilize the 4680s. All in addition, by the way, to the growing production needs of the Model Y, which will be using 4680s out of Giga Texas when it's built there as it's when it's being built there versus Fremont but also probably Berlin will we've been told to expect them to switch over and then speaking of Fremont probably at some point Tesla is going to be building the Model Y 2.0 with the 4680 battery cells in Fremont as well hopefully next year therefore Many, many 4680 cells are needed in 2023 and beyond. And it looks like with help from Panasonic, a big assist from Panasonic, that everything is lining up for exactly that scenario. And that gets me fired up as it also no doubt fires up those of you who have Cybertruck reservations as well. Hey, real quick. Uh, Another note here of news, Elon Musk has announced that AI Day number two, which I told you about a week or two back, has been pushed back by about a month. He tweeted, Tesla AI Day pushed to September 30th, as we may have an Optimus prototype working by then, end quote. Well, when I talked about this a week or two back, I had wondered that very thing. Would a working Tesla bot prototype be ready? And it seems as though that is exactly what Elon and the team are aiming for this event, which is obviously the best case scenario for this event, to have a working prototype. I can't wait to see it, literally, because Elon later added on Twitter that it will not look like the dummy version that Tesla showed at the first AI day. And if you were at Giga, uh, the, the Giga Texas Cyber Rodeo, they also had the dummy there as well. And now we know it will not, at least the first version of, of Optimus will not look like that. So I'm now curious as to what it will look like. Next this week, speaking of Elon Musk, there was one other significant and unfortunately not so great bit of news this week. It is a big one. Once again, Reuters reporting that Tesla CEO Elon Musk has a, quote, super bad feeling about the economy and needs to cut about 10% of salaried staff at the electric car maker. This is according to emails seen by Reuters. Those emails have since leaked everywhere. So, which, meaning this is authentic. A message, uh, Reuters writes, a message sent to executives this past week laid out his concerns and told them to, quote, pause all hiring worldwide. The dire outlook came two days after the billionaire told staff to return to the workplace or leave and adds to a growing chorus of warnings from business leaders about the risks of recession. In another email to employees the next day, Musk said Tesla will begin reducing salaried headcount by 10% as it has become, quote, overstaffed in many areas, end quote. But he says, hourly headcount will increase. He says, note, this does not apply to anyone actually building cars, battery packs, or installing solar. So again, this comes right on the heels of of what was a pretty sternly worded email about trying to get everybody to come back to work at the office. Now, I don't want to get into that because, quite honestly, 
the advantages and disadvantages of remote work versus on-site work, you can debate that. You can have a spirited, healthy, fair intellectual debate on both sides about that until the cows come home, and I'm not here to have that debate. But what I did want to do was just take a moment to express, honestly, I'll be honest with you, my confusion about Tesla cutting 10% of salary jobs. I don't know what overall percentage of the workforce that is because 10% of the overall workforce would be over 10,000 people because last we heard Tesla overall was over 100,000 employees, but we don't know how many of those are salaried, which is what's being targeted here versus hourly. But I think needless to say, this is likely to affect thousands of people if indeed it comes to pass as it seems like it is going to. I guess what I would say is that talking about being confused by this, which I honestly am because from the outside, as someone who follows this company so closely as I have for the last decade plus, you know, six of six, almost seven of them doing a podcast every week. It's just puzzling as to why this would happen because, all right, let's say a recession is coming. I hope not, but if it is, are there really any indications that the demand for Tesla's vehicles is going to slow down? Because that demand has only continued to rise. The wait times for these cars are getting longer, not shorter. The demand is going up, even through a global pandemic that, by the way, did also wobble the economy a bit for a few minutes there, as you may recall. And the fact is, as we stand here today, Tesla cannot expand fast enough. They can't build cars fast enough. They can't build factories fast enough. I'm not going to praise or criticize this thinking by Elon, because quite frankly, I'm not the CEO. He is. I don't have a look at the inner workings of the company. I don't, I don't work there on any level, but from the outside, as a fan, as a shareholder, as somebody keeping a close eye on Tesla, it just doesn't seem to add up when there's so much growth. Tesla has grown where others have shrunk. They have succeeded these past couple years where others have not. Others have struggled and that the gap between Tesla and other companies, both in the automotive field and, and elsewhere, that gap has widened. It's intensified. Tesla has just, we've seen it quarter after quarter, their profits are going up. Their cash on hand is going up. Everything is trending in the right direction for Tesla. And I know you'd say, well, like Elon is clearly trying to be pragmatic here and not wait for bad things to happen and try to, you know, tighten the belt, whatever, however you want to phrase it. But again, it's just, I guess what I'm trying to say is it has seemed like Tesla's success over these past, I mean, not just a couple of years, but the real like just explosive growth uh, of success over these last couple of years, it, it would seem to me that Tesla is honestly somewhat recession proof. I hope that statement's not going to get tested again, but, uh, Elon clearly does not agree. I mean, that's, that is, and he's, he's the boss. I'm just a guy, <laughs> I'm just a fan, but, um, I, I'll go, I'll close out here by saying this. I'm sending all my best out there, best wishes to all of the salaried Tesla employees who might be listening to this and probably feeling some serious anxiety right now. I would be if I were in your shoes. So hang in there. Hopefully, it is going to be okay. Finally this week, in better news, the Human Rights Campaign has shared the results of its 2022 Corporate Equality Index, and for the seventh straight year, Tesla has scored a perfect 100 out of 100 and been named one of the best places to work for LGBTQ plus equality. This comes per their official website at hrc.org. The Human Rights Campaign Foundation's Corporate Equality Index is the national benchmarking tool on corporate policies, practices, and benefits 
pertinent to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer employees. And I want to say, uh, I went to the website and I was reading through this. There's not a sort of specific write-up for, for individual companies. Tesla is not alone here, which I am thrilled to say. Tesla is on a long list of companies that got a perfect 100 out of 100 score. 842 companies got that score, to be exact. And per the HRC, to earn top ratings, these employers took concrete steps to establish and implement comprehensive policies, benefits, and practices that ensure greater equity for LGBTQ plus workers and their families. Now, for a bit of context, I'm obviously not going to go through all 842 companies that were recognized here. But if you're curious if any other automakers were on the list, there were just one, or at least one that I could find. Let me, I'll caveat, I did not go through the entire list, but I searched out all of the big car companies that have uh, a, a, some sort of major presence in America, whether it's a corporate headquarters, a manufacturing presence, or what have you. And Toyota of North America, also scoring a 100 out of 100. And that's all I could find. After, again, searching, I searched Daimler, Chrysler, GM, General Motors, Ford, uh, Dodge. You know, you, I, I searched all the other biggies I could think of. Now, if you want to lump Tesla in as a software company and or tech company, they did have some contemporaries on the list as well. Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Meta all made the list as well. So uh, kudos to Tesla for continuing to provide for the seventh year in a row here a very equitable place to work no matter what your orientation. And hopefully this list gets twice as long next year and the year after that and the year after that. I really hope so. Hopefully, hopefully there's just the list of... Hopefully the shorter list in a couple of years from now is the list of companies that don't have a 100 out of 100 uh, rating. All right, that will do it for another busy week of Tesla news. But stick with me. I've got a bunch of your excellent Ride the Lightning Hotline phone calls teed up and ready to go for you right after this. Welcome to the Ride the Lightning Hotline, your chance to call in and be a part of the podcast. I love it. I appreciate the calls, the comments, the questions. If you would like to participate, maybe you've heard something in the top half of the show that you want to respond to. Maybe you've just got a question about something or want to get a discussion topic started. You can call in in one of two easy ways. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your call, your call, pardon me, please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible, and then email that file to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com, or you can take that same 90 second or less call and just call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline itself. That number is toll free. You can dial it anytime, day or night, 24 7 it's 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Let's kick it off with Sergio from Fort Worth, Texas. Hey, Ryan, this is Sergio from Fort Worth, Texas, a big fan of your work with the Unlocked podcast and this podcast, of course. Um, so I've been wanting a Tesla for a few years now. And it's kind of funny because I've never actually sat in a Tesla before, just kind of seen them driving around. I always thought they looked really cool. So I decided to finally just schedule a test drive, and I ended up test driving a Model Y. Um, and it was quite an amazing experience. Um, I kind of had that post-Tesla driving high after about 40 minutes of driving this Tesla's Model Y, uh, I felt like I was on cloud nine. And then going back to my normal car afterwards, I could just feel the difference. It kind of ruined driving around in my car for me. Um, anyway, I'm calling because a couple of episodes back, you mentioned that the people from Austin that have ordered Model Ys might be able to start getting them from Giga Texas. Like they have that option to choose the Giga Texas Model Ys. Uh, well, being a Texas woman my whole life, I 
I think it'd be kind of cool to get a Model Y from my home state. So my question is, should I place an order here now in hopes that maybe it'll be from Texas or should I hold off until we know that Giga Texas Model Ys are being shipped out to more places than just Austin? Thanks. Hi, Sergio. I am so glad that you found this podcast and I'm happy to help contribute to your Tesla enthusiasm. I can tell you that I experienced the exact same my gas, my regular gas car is ruined feeling after I was lucky enough to drive a Tesla for the first time. Uh, for actually the first number of times. The original Roadster was the first car, first Tesla I ever got to drive. And then later the Model S. Uh, really the Model S felt, that one felt like, oh my gosh, this is the future and my car is the past. It was a sad, sad feeling getting back into my gas car back then. But hopefully you don't feel sad because you're going to get your Tesla. Now, with regard to whether or not you should try to jump on one of the Austin-built standard range Model Y 2.0s, if that 279-mile range works for you, I'd say go for it. The only thing I would caution you against is that the emails that Tesla was sending out to existing order holders about taking an Austin-built Model Y 2.0 It seemed to be pretty specific to just Austin and not the surrounding cities in Texas. So you'd have to order to even have a chance at this. You would have to order a long range Model Y since you can't order the standard range on the website yet. And then hope that Tesla emails you to offer you a Model Y 2.0 from Austin. Though honestly, I'll tell you this. If I were in your position and I were set on trying to do this, I would be proactive and I would go place my order at a Tesla store and ask to speak to a manager specifically about what you're trying to do in the event that you never know, maybe he or she can help facilitate that for you. Maybe they can, you know, put in a word up, you know, send word up the chain that, hey, we've got somebody that wants to buy one of the new cars. You never know. I mean, they might not be able to do it, uh, but it can't hurt to ask nicely. That's how I look at it. Now, it looks like that you've got two galleries in Fort Worth because Tesla has to call them galleries in Texas since they're not legally allowed to sell you a car there. But anyway, that's beside the point. If they can't get you one of these first batch Texas made Model Y, then you'd still be looking at about a nine month wait on a long range. And by the time you'd be ready for delivery, guess what? there would be a decent chance at that point, not a guarantee though, that you'd get a car from Giga Texas anyway. So either way, Sergio, whatever you decide, good luck to you. Next up is a regular caller, friend of the podcast, Bill from Wisconsin, giving an update on what is happening with Tesla in Wisconsin with regard to charging and the state's EV infrastructure. Hey, Ryan, it's Bill from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. I'm calling you this week uh, not to comment on anything specifically that you said in in the latest episode, uh, but to tell you about what's going on in Wisconsin that's Tesla-related. Specifically, we got an email this week from the president of the Tesla Owners Association to let us know that the Wisconsin Department of Transportation was hosting a webinar uh, regarding the allocation of funds from the infrastructure bill for uh, EV charge and, and how they would be allocated for EV charging in the state of Wisconsin. So, of course, uh, I was curious about that, even though Tesla has a, a nice uh, network of superchargers in the state. Uh, it would be nice to know where the money was going to go otherwise. So they gave us some detail on that. Um, I understand the webinar was supposed to be made available after the fact on the uh, Wisconsin DOT's um, automotive electrification page, which uh, I didn't know about, but when I Googled it, I was able to find it. Um, they have what they call alternative fuel corridors in the state, <clears throat> some that are already approved and some that have been applied for um, but not yet approved, and that's where they're going to be setting up these chargers. Um, I gave them, obviously, lots of input as far as um, as a as an EV driver for almost four years now, uh, what I would be looking for. Um, not surprisingly, not one of the people on the um, commission that's in charge of doing this initiative is driving an EV or has ever driven an EV. 
Uh, I offered, I, I live about three miles from the capital, Madison, and I even volunteered to drive down and, and spend a day driving them around and showing them what a, uh, what what it was like to be on the road and charging to give them an uh, appreciation for the challenges that we face. We'll see if they take me up on it. They did respond to my email and thank me for my input, uh, but they have yet to take me up on my offer. But anyhow, if any of your other listeners are in Wisconsin, I strongly urge you to go to the DOT's website, find this information, and have your voice heard. As always, Ryan, thank you very much. Soda Pop and Kerbal send their love to... Daisy, and I hope that uh, her health concerns work out well. Bill, thank you as always for your call. I am happy to play this as a PSA because this is certainly an issue that any Tesla owner and or EV enthusiast cares about. I'm happy to use my platform here to help raise awareness for issues like this that are pertinent to the Ride the Lightning community. And by the way, Bill followed up with an email that had some additional details on this, notably the specific website for those interested in looking into this further. It's at wisconsin.gov. Actually, it's literally wisconsin.gov slash pages slash projects slash multimodal slash electrification dot ASPX. Bill, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Next up, DJ from L.A. Go ahead, DJ. Hey, Ryan. What's up, man? This is DJ from L.A. I'm calling because we uh, recently got our 2017 uh, Model S, um, the EMMC uh, upgrade. You know, they had the little recall or whatever. So they upgraded the screen or the memory behind the screen, I guess you could say. And um, it's, it's doing something different now. Like for some reason now, when when you turn on the AC or the HVAC system, um, I guess when it gets to the target temperature, like if you turn it on from the app, when you get in the car and it's already reached the target temperature, it's off. So um, usually it would just stay, it would always be on and it would just maintain a constant temperature, whether that's heating or cooling. But um, once it reaches that temperature, it just turns off. So when you get in the car, it's not really, that temperature um i talked to tesla and they said it's supposed to do that um i don't know if that's true but it definitely didn't do that before it would just always be on so um hopefully that makes sense um curious if you know anything about this appreciate it thanks dj thanks for calling in Uh, this is definitely a strange one i confess i've never heard of it but then again i'm not a model s owner I agree with you, though, that it doesn't seem right, so I'm surprised to hear Tesla tell you that this is expected behavior. I hate to say this, but I'm not sure how else to be helpful, so here goes. You might want to try a different service center. There have been plenty of stories in the Tesla community over the years of people having, unfortunately, wildly different experiences at one service center versus another. Good luck to you on this. Keep in touch. Corey from Westchester is our final caller for this week. Go ahead, Corey. Hi, Ryan. This is Corey from Westchester. Uh, Thanks again for everything you do. And I hope uh, Daisy the Boxer Puppy, and not so much a puppy anymore, is doing well. Uh, I have a question because I put a new Model Y on order, and I'm really not tied down to when I receive the car or whether I get a long range or a performance. Uh, I know if I get the performance, I'll get it sooner. If I get the long range, I'll probably be waiting until November at the earliest. But my question is, I really want to get the ventilated seats and LFP technology. Now, I don't know if the LFPs are going to be in the Model Y anytime soon, but at least the ventilated seats, I've seen a lot of that noise uh, popping up. So the question is, in order to get that technology, the LFP and the ventilated seats. Should I wait? Should I get a performance model? Should I get a long range? Uh, You know, again, I'm not tied down to when I get it or which model I get. Uh, Any advice would be very much appreciated. Thanks. Corey, thank you so much for your kind words about Daisy. As you heard at the top, I was fortunate enough to get some good news this week. So it felt really good. Now to your question, I wish I had a more pleasing answer for you, but unfortunately, the answer is that you cannot get that combination in a Model Y. And worse, you can't get either of them separately either. 
The only car in the entire Tesla lineup that uses LFP batteries in the United States right now is the base Model 3. And the only vehicles that have ventilated seats are the new S and X. While it's certainly true that you never know with Tesla, in my opinion, I just don't see either of them, let alone both of those options converging uh, anytime soon. We do know that the standard range Y is available if you do live in Austin. We were talking about that earlier in the podcast with another caller, but we also know that those are using the new 4680 cells and Tesla has been clear that those cars are not going to use LFP. I think the ventilated seats are probably unlikely for the time being as well. If you want that LFP battery, you can max out every day with it and it has shown to have next to zero degradation. And if you do want to go that way, you can save yourself a bunch of money by switching to the base Model 3, which is going to give you that daily daily usable range of 272 miles for a $45,000 base price, which is, of course is nearly 20000 less than the long-range Model Y. But sadly, you cannot get ventilated seats in any Tesla without buying... Well, in the 3 or the Y. You can't get those ventilated seats without buying a $100,000 plus you know, Model S or Model X. So I'm sorry to break the bad news, but those bits aside, you're probably going to be pretty happy with whichever Model Y you do end up choosing to get. Thanks, Corey, and thanks to everybody who took the time to call in. I promise I will get to even more phone calls on next week's podcast. I gave you the information on how to call into the Ride the Lightning hotline at the top of this segment, so you can refer back to that. It's also in the show notes, the show description, uh, with every episode, so you can check that as well. Stick with me. I will be right back. I've got some more to talk about, including your pro tip of the week, coming up right after this. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. As for what's going on with me and my car, unfortunately, I did not get my windshield, my cracked windshield, replaced this week. About, I think it was one or, I think it was maybe two days before my scheduled service appointment, I got a message in the Tesla app from the service team, and they said, we don't have the part for you yet. We don't have the windshield, so we're going to have to push this out at least two weeks, so they moved my appointment two weeks out, and... I just have to hope that hopefully in two weeks they've got a windshield for me. So we'll see how long this ends up taking. But that was a little bit of a bummer this week. But at the very least, the crack isn't in my line of sight, which the first windshield that cracked on me when a rock hit me on the highway, it was. It was right in my... So it was really annoying. But this one at least is over on the passenger side. So it's not as annoying. But still, I really want to get that taken care of sooner rather than later. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, By the way, I wanted to ask, did anybody else's, this may sound crazy, did anybody else's steering get lighter? Did it feel lighter after the latest software update? Because mine absolutely did. It's it's not a hardware thing. At first I was like, wait a second, does this car need to be aligned or what's going on with this? But no, it was right after the most recent software update. And I think the... The FSD branch that I'm on, feature-wise, as far as the you know non-FSD features, I think is now caught up to the production uh, software branch, at least for now. And so I think I think I can ask this question to any of you. If you want to email me, tweet me. What I don't think you need to call in with it, but uh, yeah, it's I, I'm telling you, it, it got noticeably lighter. So I don't know about you. Everybody's got their preference. I like my steering on Sport, which is the the stiffest of the, the sort of firmest of the steering, the three steering modes. And it, boy, it got a lot lighter, noticeably lighter. I tried switching it to normal and then switching it back to Sport just to see, well, maybe something got kind of, you know, messed up during, in the update. Nope, that, that did not do it. So I don't know if Tesla did anything or if I'm going crazy, but... I could swear that my steering got noticeably lighter with the latest software update. Uh, In better news, let's celebrate a win for a second 
for somebody who's done a lot in the Tesla community, particularly here in the San Francisco Bay Area. John, the president of the Tesla owners of Silicon Valley Club, which is a, a very, there's, there's a lot of members. It's a big club. There's always a lot of good events going on. They, they, they really, the, the leadership team in the, in the Silicon Valley Club does a great job of coordinating a lot of neat stuff for club members. Well, John, he got to sit down with Elon Musk for an interview about the early days of Tesla. It was sort of um, put together on Twitter, and it actually happened. John, I texted him, was congratulating him, asking him kind of how it came together, and he ended up taking a a last-minute flight out to Texas, out to Austin to go do it after Elon said he would do it. And, And boy, I'm so happy for John because... And I want to congratulate him because I know he had been so very badly wanting to meet Elon for such a long time. In fact, John has probably tweeted at Elon more than anyone else I've ever seen. He is <laughs> he's very active on Twitter with Elon and he gets a lot of responses from Elon by virtue of, of uh, his approach. And he finally got to sit down with him. I have not had a chance to actually watch. So part one of the interview is up, at least as of my recording here on Friday night. But it covers the early days. So, you know, just to set expectations, Elon probably doesn't say anything new or, you know, forward looking things about Cybertruck or what have you. Although, you know, for all I know, maybe that comes up in the second part. But the, the whole thing was pitched as a setting the record straight about the early days of Tesla and the first the first episode uh, from just browsing it on YouTube is exactly about that. But I'm going to check it out this weekend. But I just wanted to say congratulations to John. Very, very happy for him to uh, to to achieve that because I know it meant a lot to him to get that sit down. As my interview, I can I can empathize with him. I it, my Elon interview meant a lot to me back in 2019 when I got to sit down with Elon for episode 200 of this podcast. Hey, one other quick thing. This is non-Tesla related, but if you just humor me for a second. So the 2023 Chevy Bolt is, uh, it's not out yet. It's out in a couple months. It's supposed to be out this summer. It is being slashed by like six grand down to $25,000 and change as the starting price. And it's Probably, I mean, Chevy put out a quote that's like, oh, the unprecedented demand of EVs. Well, sure, but I mean, I, again, I don't mean this maliciously, but they're they're probably cutting the price so drastically because nobody wants the Chevy Bolt after its, you know, its, its name is toxic now after those very real battery fires and that they had to stop production for a long time. But the thing is, 25K on the new ones, they've fixed the issue. And I have to say, so my wife, I was talking to her about it. She is now seriously considering getting one to replace her now 18-year-old Mini Cooper that she doesn't want to have to put any more money into. And she is very adamant about wanting a small car. And she definitely wants an EV. But Tesla doesn't have any small cars on the way in the next few years. And my guess would be that the Bolt name being so toxic uh, is that that the Bolt won't sell very well, even at a lower price point, and that uh, that GM will just phase out the Bolt in the next couple of years, and then they'll relaunch a a new EV under a new name in a few years from now. That would be my guess. And so I almost feel like, well, wait a second. This could be, now again, now that this issue is resolved, seemingly, I guess we don't know for sure, but they seem to have identified and corrected the issue, that you know this could be a good, literally a buy low opportunity on a, on a Chevy Bolt. And so I just want to ask out there, uh, since again, it seems like it might be the right car for my wife in lieu of a small Tesla, if there are any Bolt owners out there I would love to hear from you with regard to your absolutely candid and honest thoughts on the car after owning it, both what you really like, what to watch out for, what you don't like, etc. Again, you can email me, teslapodcast at gmail.com. Hey, real quick, an entertainment recommendation. I know I try to keep these family friendly, but uh, one of my favorite shows is back on season three. It's The Boys on Prime Video 
It is a superhero show that is uh, very dark, extraordinarily violent and profane. It's kind of a, like, what if superheroes were bad? That's sort of what it asks. What That's sort of its central premise. It's based off a comic book that I haven't read, but I've been watching the show, loving the show. The first couple episodes of season three are just more of this, more of the same, which for me is a good thing. So not family friendly in any way, but if you're looking for, if that sounds appealing to you, you can find that on Prime Video. All right, how about a pro tip of the week that your kids can listen to here? So here's Ted from Los Angeles. Hi, Ryan and Daisy. Just found your podcast last month, and I love the show. Here's something that might be a pro tip, but it's definitely a question. When I use the autopilot and I'm heading into traffic, if I notice my family starting to tense up, I spin the max speed wheel to slow down so that I can stay on autopilot and not disengage. Will this increase the wear and tear of that spinning wheel? Will it damage it? Will it fail? Um, if the answer to that is no, then this is a pro tip to stay in autopilot on the freeway and help your passengers feel a little at ease. Um, if it's not, then I guess I have to stop doing it. Um, this is Ted Willett from Los Angeles and Trailer Junkies Podcast. Hey, Ted, welcome to the podcast. I am very glad to hear that you're enjoying it, and thank you for calling in. Well, I have to say this is a solid pro tip. I, too, am a liberal user of the right scroll wheel on the steering wheel. It is great for, as you said helping to maintain a nice, smooth autopilot experience. And by the way, no need to worry about abusing that right scroll wheel. It is gonna be fine. I've only ever seen a broken scroll wheel once, and it was the left scroll wheel, for whatever that's worth, and it was on an old Model S 75D loaner car that I had once while my car was in for service. Those scroll wheels that they use on the old S and X aren't used anymore, and those steering wheels aren't used anymore. The SX3 and Y all now have sturdy metal scroll wheels on their respective steering apparatuses. And even the older threes like mine that have a plastic scroll wheel, I have yet to hear about anyone who's had a problem with it. So I'm counting this one as a pro tip. Ted, thank you again for your call. And if anybody else out there has a pro tip of the week about your Tesla that you'd like to share with everybody, myself included, please call in with it the same way that you would send in a regular Ride the Lightning hotline call. Before I go, let me mention some friends of the podcast, uh, maybe some, some vendors here that can help you out. Uh, I also mentioned the Patreon, but I mentioned the Patreon at the top. I, gave you, I spent plenty of time on that. So again, patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, if at some point, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, next week, next month, you feel like that I have earned your support, because I know it's earned and not given. I, that's, uh, that's what I'm working towards here, to earn your support. AbstractOcean.com has a million excellent aftermarket accessories for your Tesla, any of the four of them. Go to AbstractOcean.com, use the coupon code RTLPODCAST at checkout, to get 15% off of your first order. They have excellent interior lighting kits, either brighter lights or different colored lights or brighter different colored lights. They've got the custom fit fourth generation tempered glass screen protectors. They've got the rear footwell lighting kits, which again, I think are great in the Model Y, drop-in cup holder stabilizer, et cetera, et cetera. They've just got so much. You gotta just take a look. Go there, abstractocean.com and browse by your vehicle, SX3 or Y. And then when you, again, if you, you find a bunch of stuff you like, pile it into your online shopping cart. Use that coupon code RTLPODCAST, all one word, at checkout for 15% off of your first order. The Snap Plate, also available for all four Teslas. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL. It's the front license plate bracket that is for people like me that hate having to do a front license plate. It's paint safe, grill safe, radiator safe, and autopilot safe, a nice clean, minimal design, blends nicely with the front end when it's installed, and leaves nothing behind if you wanna remove it. Maybe you wanna remove it for car shows, maybe you wanna remove it for uh, washing the car, detailing the car, put it back on for when you're parked at a parking meter, or if you're going through a toll road, a bridge, etc., etc. Get yours at everyamp.com/rtl. 
Meanwhile, budget safe solar. Every Tesla owner out there has probably a pretty good, if not exact idea of the cost of the electricity that your Tesla uses, but we all have that information based on today's electric grid rates. None of us know how much these rates might go up in the next half decade, decade, or more, except people with solar. So, you know, you've got a fixed cost there. And in fact, basically, you're going to be driving on sunshine for free if you get solar. So if you've thought about getting solar installed at your home or office, you can contact Budget Safe Solar. They're a friend of the podcast. The website, again, budgetsafesolar.com. Their byline, their motto is capping tomorrow's energy costs today. And if you have uh, considered entering the field, the growing field of solar yourself, they'd also like to hear from you about that. Learn more and or reach out to them at budgetsafesolar.com. And if you do end up proceeding with a solar installation at your home or office, please, I, I humbly ask, use the referral code RTL. You'll be doing me a favor if you do that. Immaculate Reflections, if you and your car are going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area and you'd like to treat your car to a spa day or uh, multiple days, depending the extent of the services you'd like done, maybe a spa week, Immaculate Reflections is there for you. As always, they're offering the nice discount for listeners of this podcast. So when you reach out, which you can do via the website, which is irdetailing.com, just mention, hey, I'm a Ride the Lightning listener. May I please have the discount? And Jeff, the owner and proprietor there, will tell you, yes, no problem. Maybe you want to do paint correction, get your paint finished looking as good as it possibly can, better than it came from the factory, I promise you. That was the case with my car after Jeff got done with it. Maybe you want to do paint protection film on some of the car, all the car, most of the car, whatever the case may be. Maybe you want to do ceramic coating so that you don't have to wax the car for the next few years. Whatever the case may be, go to irdetailing.com. I promise you, again, straight from the bottom of my heart, I have I know this man. I've come to know him and love him. I love him as a detailer. I love him as a human being. He's just a genuinely good person who is also an insanely talented. Like he's meticulous. He'll even tell you himself, like, he wraps the rocker panels underneath the car where no one will see it unless you, like, have the car in a lift. But he's just, he, he goes the extra mile. And you can, if you ever see my car, if you ever meet me, you can check out my car and see his work for yourself. Uh, PureTesla.com slash RTL. That website is the one to go to for all your dash cam and sentry mode needs. 128 gigabyte kit that's SD, micro SD based, pardon me. That means it's gonna just last and last because micro SD is designed for the constant reading and writing that the sentry mode and dash cam do, which regular USB flash memory is not really geared for. It's gonna just work. So I've got the 128 gig kit in my car. Go to, again, puretesla.com slash RTL to order yours, 49 bucks for that 128 gig kit. Uh, comes fully formatted and ready to go Ready to go out of the package. Free shipping anywhere in the U.S., which is pretty cool. And wireless game controllers, they also have those uh, as another product as well. If those are of interest, it's a nice kind of, as I like to say, Super Nintendo-inspired, like, slimline game controller. Because let's be honest, the as much as I think, I, I personally think that the Xbox Series X controller is the best overall video game controller controller ever made. Nothing against the DualShock from PlayStation, but I think just for my money, the, the Xbox is the best controller, but both the Xbox and the DualShock are pretty bulky. They're not, I mean, they're they're meant for ergonomic, but they're not small. These uh, wireless game controller kits that puretesla.com slash RTL has are designed to be slimmer and smaller so they can just fit and you can, you can just leave them in your center console and break them out when you're ready to play some games while you're maybe supercharging or waiting for your spouse to come out of the grocery store or waiting for your kids to get out of school, whatever the case may be. Check them out. Uh, and finally, I mentioned the Patreon. Oh, you can follow slash subscribe to this podcast for free 
on any of the major podcast services. And I encourage you to do that so that you don't have to remember to go and find the show yourself each week. It'll just push out to you automatically. I am on most of the major ones, including Apple Podcasts, which seems to be where most of you get the podcast, but also Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify, with those two being available natively in your Tesla. I'm also on YouTube. It's just audio only. There's no video. But if you do want to listen on YouTube, just when you're on YouTube, search Ride the Lightning Tesla. You'll find my channel and can subscribe very easily there. Again, you can always email me teslapodcast at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at the same handle for both, DMC underscore Ryan. And uh, with that, let me say hello and thank you to those Plaid, Maximum Plaid, and Roadster in Space tier backers. Starting with the Plaid crew again, Plaid's going away, but the uh, your, your pledges are not, and you don't have to upgrade them, you don't have to do anything. You're gonna get grandfathered into those monthly Zoom hangouts. So a thank you to these longtime supporters at the Plaid level. George Cassiopo, David Brander. I hope to catch all of you, by the way. I hope some of you will uh, will take advantage of that Zoom Hangout opportunity now. So looking forward to that uh, starting this weekend. George Cassiopo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Jason Chalukas, Tim Hyde, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, Jeremy, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peake, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Noel and Lucy Murphy, the Tesla owners East Bay Club, Ryan Natchett, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Travis Krenzel, Matt Nixon, the Tesla owners Club of Wisconsin, Jonathan Zelesny, Ish, Mike Huffines, Mike, pardon, if I've mispronounced that, please let me know and I will fix it. Not Elon Musk, T. Kirk Lowry, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. The Maximum Plaid crew, thank you so much to Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from Las Vegas, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Ulrich Lassa, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Hay Watley, Eric Brown, Mark Eversoll, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Mait Suaru, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Alex Brem, Tyler Smith, Corey O'Donnell, Matthew Graham Droneberger, Scott Gillis, Aaron Huxley, John Cody, Aaron, Andre Kent, Joel Sapp, Kim Bay, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, Zach Schwartz, KB, Matt Asbury, and We Drive Tesla EV Luxury Car Rental of Oahu, Hawaii. Finally, the Roadster in Space tier backers. A sincere thank you goes out to Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Scooter Ward, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Crafty Geek, Richard Stokes, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacovetto, and Tesla Hitchhiker 42. Again, thanks to everybody past, present, and future for supporting my podcasting efforts here on Patreon. Again, as I, as I hope is clear every week, a lot of time goes into this every single week, a lot of energy and research and enthusiasm. And I hope, uh, I hope, I mean, if you've made it this far, I hope that you definitely enjoy the podcast now that we're in what an hour and 10 minutes in. But in any case, uh, that does bring us to the end of Ride the Lightning episode 357 for a snoozing Daisy the Boxer, who I am so thrilled will seemingly not need to have major knee surgery, uh, which would involve a significant rehab. I am so, so grateful for that good news. I hope all of you are well. I hope all of your pets are well, your family. And I wish you happy electric motoring. We're heading into summer. I mean, it's June. So here we go. Summertime. Time to get out and drive. Enjoy the cars. I hope you do that. And uh, I'll see you next week. I'll be here, of course, as I am. I'll actually be recording the show from Los Angeles next week. So I will be bringing my travel mic 
be working off my laptop, but uh, if, if all goes well, you won't even notice. That's the goal, is you won't even know that I'm recording it from somewhere else. But uh, looking forward, I'm going to be down there on business. Looking forward to uh, be the, f- well, in a rare business trip at this point, as things slowly kind of come back to normal. But looking forward to getting down there. In any case, uh, for now, that's that'll do it. I'm Ryan McCaffrey again for Daisy the Boxer. This was Ride the Lightning, episode 357, and I will see you back here same time next week. I mean, I think a Tesla... It's the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.